If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Our guest today at Horse Chats is Katrin Silver, and um, Katrin actually started riding in Germany, started off doing dressage or dressage, then came to the U.S., thought she was riding Western, but then realized that I think of the similarities. We're going to talk to her a little bit about that and um, the types of horses that she's working with and the breeds that she's working with and, um, you know, her thoughts on those particular breeds doing um, dressage or dressage. But before that, I'd just like to remind you about International Horse College. So International Horse College, which was called Ozentech Academy, and I think Ozentech is uh, Australian International Equestrian <laughs> Courses. So International Horse College was born out of a need to improve safety in the horse industry while considering the welfare of horses. So if you're a horse person who holds these values and would like to gain government accredited qualifications within the horse industry, then have a look at the wide variety of flexible course options at internationalhorsecollege.com. Just go and um, contact our friendly staff through internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Now, welcome, Katrin. How are you? Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm great. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Katrin, we, I often will say dressage, and I know that, you know, where you are, you say dressage. So I'm going to jump in ahead and, and say straight up, both the same, slightly different accent. But tell us a little bit, first of all, just so we can get to know you, about your favourite quote. What would you say would be your favourite quote? And not only that, what have you learned from it? Or is it a favourite quote that you teach all the time? Just tell us a little bit what your favourite quote is and, you know, how it came to be. Okay, so my favorite quote is by a German, uh, you know, a long dead guy named Udo Bürger uh, with the German umlaut. And uh, it roughly translates as something like, you know, learning to ride horses is super easy as long as you don't know too much about it. But once you've been trying it for a few years, it's a very different story. So <laughs> I think about that a lot because it's like I've been a professional horse trainer and I've spent most of my adult life riding, you know, um, eight, nine, ten horses a day and always learning and always taking lessons. And now I'm 50 years old and I think, oh, my God, will I ever learn anything? And so, I've, uh, yeah. I've got to tell you a story about um, Ricky McMillan, who's a, a local, you know, lives in Queensland, fairly local, but she represented Australia in the Olympics. And when she did her first ever, ever, ever dressage test, dressage was fairly new to Australia and she was on a property out west and I think the judge gave her 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 9, 10, 10, 10. So she didn't quite get the perfect 10. <laughs> and um, the reason she wanted to do dressage was to aim for that perfect, you know, 10, 10, 10 all the way across the board. And she's never achieved it, but uh, that would be a perfect example with, you know, learning dressage is easy. You can almost get there. But then, you know, as I said, riding at the Olympic level, she's, she's still never got that, you know, perfect, perfect 10 for every movement in a test. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. But yeah, I feel that a lot as we go. Oh, now I know how to ride this one horse. And yeah, then I get on a different horse. And of course, then I feel like I know absolutely nothing. And I think that'll never end. Yeah, yeah. Now, Captain, you started riding dressage in Germany. What brought you to the States? You And what brought you into the Western disciplines? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I grew up in Germany in the 1970s, and I was a teenager in the 1980s, and I rode dressage like everybody rode there, and I was just one of the barn girls who hung out and hopped on everything that you know they were allowed to ride. I mean, my parents never had any money, so I would never get to show or you know ride anything very fancy, so I just catch rode and rode horses other people didn't want to ride, and you could say that now all those years later I'm still doing that. But, uh, yeah, Western riding uh, came into Europe in the um, 1980s, and I, I saw an exhibit, I saw a competition, I think it was at the Americana in Munich in 1982 or three, and I was just a kid, and I was just so utterly impressed. I just thought, oh my God, those horses are going around on a loose rein, and some of them aren't even wearing bits in their mouth, and it was just the most amazing thing, and they do all those things, and it just looks so effortless and so easy. And at the time, I thought dressage is just so hard, and you get yelled at a lot. And 
and everything is so heavy and everything is so much work and it's always you know you know you know the German instructors how they you know, back then it was even worse you know they'd yell at you more lift and more rain and more contact and you know everything is harder and and I never felt really happy and I never felt that the horses were very happy either and I thought there's got to be an easier way and then I saw the Western writers and I thought oh my God that's what I want to do so I kept. Uh, you know, trying to seek out Western stables in Germany that were just starting. Of course, people didn't know very much about it. And then as soon as I graduated from high school, um, Italy was a little bit ahead of uh, Germany in that there were uh, more Western trainers there. So I went there for a year and I met some American Western trainers. And, uh, one of them, who was a judge at a quarter horse show, said, oh, if you're ever in the area, just come by. And I didn't know back then. I took it very literally. I thought, well, yeah, I didn't know that Americans should say things like that. And you should take it literally. So I saved up money for a one-way ticket, which in those days you could do. It was in 1990, and yeah, I was 19 years old. I'd, I'd never been on an airplane before, and I just came over to the U.S. on my trip with Visa, and uh, I knocked on this trainer's door, and I said, here I am, put me to work. And so um, I worked for several different Western trainers, and I overstayed my tourist visa. I was an illegal alien for several years. I just never went back. And so I worked for, you know, for Western show trainers and Western, uh, you know, different types of Western trainers, reining trainers. And I figured out very quickly that that, that nice loose rein and all those things that, you know, it wasn't all there is. And then there's a lot of abuse going on there, too. And so then eventually, once I struck out on my own and I started my own business, I came back to dressage. I just thought I just revisited the whole notion. And I thought, well, um, you know, at least uh, you don't have to beat up the horses. I had to say, your trip to America took me back. I was in the UK and I was doing, you know, British Horse Society exams because we didn't have uh, we didn't have a system in Australia then. So I was over in the UK going through my um, British Horse Society exams, and there was um, someone there from the US, and uh, she said that to me too. She said, "Well, if you're ever in the, you know, in the states, make sure you let me know." <laughs> And um, yeah, oh, I'm, oh, no. well, I was in. Then I went. I think I went to Germany, for, and then I was staying with another friend on a United States Army base. And they said, "Oh no, you just put it in the post office box at the Army base, and it'll get there." Well, by the time there was a bit of a delay in the mail, and by the time I was in Miami, you know, I said, "I'll call her from the airport," and I uh, called her from the airport, and and she was like, "Oh, oh, right, well." <laughs> You know, so so that was exactly the same, and I yeah, and and I think the little bit about the um overstaying the tourist visa, I might have um yeah, I might have overstayed mine a little bit too, or or not not so much overstayed it, but because I, I got it extended, but I think there might have been a gap between my first visa and my second visa. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it would be a lot more difficult to do that now. I mean, in the end, I was you know I was so completely illegal. I I ended up getting married, so it was not yeah, <laughs> it was not a bad decision, like I see. But I'm still married to the same guy, but without you know the the prospect of a green card, I might not have done that. And I think what I did though is I went to an eventing bar, you know. So that's what really got me because I'd been more of a show jumper before I went to the UK and then went to the US, and and they were. The eventing barn, it was Rocking Horse Ranch in Florida. You know, that was the main area that I went. And I think there was a, a Sewell Ranch, a, a place near there that did a bit of Western. But no, I was I was just hooked on the whole eventing thing and, you know, stayed there for a long time and did my first few events there and came back to Australia. And because I'd been away for a couple of years, eventing was just starting to catch on here and, uh, yeah, came back. And So what was the, what was the big uh, horse? Uh, activity in Australia, then I'm curious. Like, what what was what, what were people mainly doing? look in Australia it was more uh, when when I first started and I was doing pony club. It was a lot more uh, pony club, you know, bending, barrel, flagging, uh, and then a little bit of show jumping. And then, of course, the show jumping. You know, I got a bit hooked on that. That was lots of fun, and and ended up sort of riding and jumping at um at Brisbane Royal. So so to jump at a royal show, you know, that's sort of a pretty big deal. And and that I thought I thought that that was um that was the way I was going. But no, then when I went to the states, I was just hooked. And and because I'd had a bit more training in in the dressage, um, I was coming back, and I came back and. Whereas previously my flat work was not good, but I'd had the training in the, in uh, the UK and then in the states, 
then it became quite good so I could come back and actually, you know, oh, Glennis, you won the dressage at that event. And, you know, that would be quite a common thing, but only because I'd had the training and I'd had more training than most Australians. Yeah. It's the same here in New Mexico. It's like, yeah, um, we uh, yeah, uh, we have a, a big eventing barn and uh, close by, and so we have some schooling dressage shows that they host there. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of the event guys that I talk to. They say, oh, you know, this the flat work, and they 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 they're very dismissive about it. And then they really get into it, and then all of a sudden, everything gets so much better. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And I think you were going to tell us about the dressage because I think that you know when I was doing the show jumping initially. Dressage was just, you know, and even even thinking about eventing, it was like um, something that you had to do before you're allowed out on the cross country. Whereas once you really get into the dressage, you go, wow, this is improving the show jumping. You can see this is improving the, not only just improving the, the test results, but improving the the show jumping and and um, improving the cross country and it just improves everything. But you've gone on and found that, the dressage is improving the Western. I think that was sort of where we were going with that, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, yeah, that's what I, uh, uh, you know, I really thought about. So I, uh, yeah, I had been working for all the Western trainers. I have a Western pleasure trainer, which I don't know if you know what that is. It's, it's like a, it's a horrible thing for horse go forward and, and uh, yeah. Uh, it was absolutely horrible, but it was good that I worked for you know, the Western Pleasure Trainer because it made me, I, I'll never forget those images of what people did to make the horses go that way. And I remember waking up one morning and, and, and realizing very clearly, I don't ever want to do this to a horse. And so I, I will never forget that. And I'm actually very, very grateful to this trainer to this day. But then it brought me, all those things brought me back to dressage. And I thought, well, you know, it's not that different than what I've always learned as a kid and, and, and what I really want in a horse. It's, it's not that different. And, and every horse should learn how to bend and how to move away from the leg and then how to balance. And, and uh, you know, I revisited the training skill and I thought, oh, well, that's not that different from what I do. Uh, so I, uh, you know, when I first went uh, into my business on my own, I took in a lot of, you know, green horses for starting and, and, and horses from different backgrounds that needed retraining and that weren't very rideable. And, and so that's when I got back into my early dressage training and, and, and it helped all of them. And, and my clients thought, oh, this is really cool. So tell us more about that. So then I thought, well, you know, maybe you don't have to do dressage, the the, the very uh, the old fashioned German way where you have a lot of weight in your hands and, 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 and people yell at you, but maybe there's something beautiful to it. Mm, mm, mm. When you said about the, you know, the Western pleasure horses and, and you realized that you never, ever, you know, wanted that. When I was in the States, I had the opportunity to ride Tennessee walking horse, okay, which was just the most, and I've still got to say, the most amazing experience. You'd be galloping like gallop speed, but the ride was so smooth. But then I found out a little bit more about the training of the Tennessee walking horse. And I thought, no, no matter how wonderful the feeling was um, to ride a Tennessee walking horse, no horse should go through that to... Um, yeah, and I bet that really influenced you in a, in a lasting way. Yeah, I bet that really... Got, yeah, it's like, I yeah, I really feel like I owe a lot to this very, very abusive trainer that I worked for for a while because I never forget the images. And that is when I, yeah, I, was, I think I was 23 or 24 at the time. And I just thought, no, this is, I will never, ever, ever do this. And then I started looking for a better way. So, yeah, you know, wait, we owe those, those, those uh, bad experiences and those bad trainers that were around, we owe them a lot. I think so. I think so. I think, you know, they show you the way it's not supposed to be done, you know, and you start to look at the, the horses and you start to look in horses' eyes and look at the expression on their face. And I know that there's a lot of research going into expressions of horses' faces, but horse people will tell you that, of course, horses will have expressions on their face. Of course, you look into their eyes. Of course, they will, you know, they will tell you that they're fearful or confident or, you know, there's lots of lots of different emotions that are going in just looking at the expressions and not just body language, but expressions on their face. Oh, definitely. No, I, I can see it in their eyes. I can, I can see it in, in, in their little wrinkles. I just look at a horse and I know if that horse is happy or not. And it's, it's yeah, it, it's really, really clear. 
to me, and, and I know a lot of people you know, don't believe it, like my husband, he will say, well, horses all look the same, but it's only because he hasn't really been around them enough. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, it must have been a bit challenging then, you know, coming and, and you being a dressage rider, trying to show people then how to do West, you know, like what sort of challenges did you have coming from a different discipline or having a bit of a mixture of disciplines? Yeah, I had the mixture of the disciplines, and it was a challenge to sort it all back out and to think this is something I want to keep doing. This is something that I don't ever want to do. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, um, and really, yeah, you know, what I found amazing was how much good Western horses I yeah, you know, and, and I did yeah, you know, I, I did ride some excellent Western horses and some and and work with with a couple of really really good Western trainers. And I realized, oh, so this is a, what a good dressage horse should feel like. All the stuff that I had read about and never really felt. I could now feel it that there was lightness and balance and the horse was responsive and the horse was happy and the horse was working with me. And so then I started to realize it's really all the same thing that we want. And the differences between good dressage and good Western are very superficial. And so, uh, you know, the challenge was then to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, to not really use the word dressage around the Western riders because they have a low <laughs> opinion of it. So. Okay. Okay. So what did you do? You just called it flat work. No, 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 flat work, that's a jumping expression. No, I just said, you know, it's like this is good riding and, and this is what we try to do. And, and uh, you know, you, you, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you try to avoid, uh, you know, trigger words like, uh, you know, uh, and I have to say that, that dressage riders in, in Germany and the U.S., I think it's, you know, they, they, I don't know if it's true in Australia, some, a lot of them are very arrogant. When I came back to dressage and I went to, to clinics with, uh, you know, German and, and other clinicians and, and, and I took my little quarter horses, you know, there and then I competed at recognized shows and I got a lot of, you know, uh, very, very negative comments and, you know, even from judges who said, what are you doing with that horse that's not even a real dressage horse and, you know, what are you doing at this clinic? Why are you wasting my time, I mean, not in so many words, but that's the impression I got. And I thought, why are you being so arrogant? This is a horse. A horse is a horse. And this horse deserves my time and my training and, 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 and the, the, the best life has to offer just like any other horse. And so, um, yeah, so um, I can understand where there's a lot of the, the, the Western riders and, and endurance riders and a lot of the people I work with, they're very leery of the dressage crowd because they've been snubbed a lot. And I don't know if that's, you know, if you've experienced that in Australia, but, you know, I think there is no place for that in the world of, of dressage or horses or anywhere, and life is really much too short. And uh, a horse is always a horse. And, and, and if I ever reach a point uh, in my life where I say, oh, this horse isn't worth my, my time and my expertise, then somebody please just pull me off that horse because then I should not be working with any horse. Yeah, no, I think so. I think I think you know, there's there is discrimination, even color discrimination. There is, but then I think you're right. Then you get people who who say, "Yep, okay, I can see," you know, that maybe that horse is not going to go as far as what um, a horse of a different breed. But then sometimes horses surprise us too, you know. And there's been, you know, lots of stories of like a pony jumping in the Olympics and a you know a different colored horse. And- oh, I had a. I had a Norwegian fjord in training some years ago, and and that pony with that really thick fjord neck learned to do every, like all the movements of third level, the half puzzles, the flying changes, everything. And I got a lot of comments, you know, from people like, "Oh my God, she can't come on the bit; she'll choke." Yeah, <laughs> she learned everything. And little quarter horses too, where you you don't think, "Oh, there's so much movement in there," but they can. I mean, they they they, they do surprise you. And, uh, you know, and then I work with a lot of uh, clients who compete in, in, in Western events like the ranch riding that, you know, and, and they say, oh, they, you know, what you teach us is really, really good for, for our discipline. So, um, you know, the, yeah, there's nothing wrong with a horse that's straight and the horse that bends left and right and the horse that's responsive to the leg and the horse that accepts the contact with the bit and then you can lighten that. So, uh, no, I think there's. A, I think we should all focus so much more on, on, on what we have all in common rather than on, on the superficial differences. Yeah, and I think, too, if you're coming in as a professional instructor, professional coach, sometimes you've got to teach what's in front of you and treat everyone equally, you know, give them all equal time and attention and give them, oh, absolutely. Give them the, um, the time and attention they deserve because – just because, a, you know, someone's there with a horse that's not got the potential that another person has, they've still paid you for your time. They still deserve your time and attention to, to help them. Well, exactly. 
Yeah, that's part of professional ethics. I, I don't understand how anyone can, can do that differently. Uh, yeah, if somebody pays me for a lesson or for training, well, then I will spend the time and I will, you know, spend, you know, I will, you know, uh, do the best that's in my power and my knowledge to help that horse be the best horse you know, he or she can be. And and that's my job. And, and yeah, it's not just, you know, I mean, I know trainers who say, oh, well, this is not a horse that will make me look good at a competition. So please take that horse back home and buy me or, 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 or put a different horse in training with me so I can look good. And it's like, no, actually, the question we should ask is how can we make the horse look look better and feel better? instead of how can that horse make me look better. Yep, yep, yep. Just thinking about, you know, and you would have had challenges, you know, like like we've sort of talked about. How did you deal with them? Do you think it's getting better now that Western breeds are more accepted in dressage? And the other thing is too, that dressage breeds are more accepted in Western. Do you think that's happening? Well, it's uh, exciting things are happening, yes. So a lot of the mainstream dressage you know, trainers and judges – uh, are more open to a wider variety of horse breeds now because they're realizing they've alienated a lot of, uh, you know, client, protect clients or potential clients uh, who they could be working with. And so I think there's a softening happening there. And then also we now have in the U.S., we now have this uh, new and very fast growing discipline called Western dressage, uh, you know, that grew out of this whole that uh, you know, uh, dressage is for all horses and it's, you know, it can make a better Western horse. And so now there's levels of competition there. And I just went to the Quarter Horse World Show and uh, you know, placed in the top 10 there with a Quarter Horse that, you know, in Western dressage. And so it was the first time they, they had that at Quarter Horse World. So it's, it's a very exciting thing. And, and I think it'll be uh, you know, very good for, the, the, uh, for all types of horses and all types of riders to, you know, get the best that Rosard has to offer and say, okay, well, you know, it's like you can do that in a Western saddle and you can, you know, do a, a, a pivot where the horse plants a pivot foot instead of the turn on the haunches where the horse keeps marching around. And, you know, those are fairly superficial differences. So, no, I think things are improving. Okay, okay. So, and I know you try and, you know, very much try and help the person with the horse they've got. It's very easy for people to come along and especially people who deal a little bit in horses to come along and say that horse is no good but if you pay me x i've got the right horse for you and i know that's sort of against your ethics and you you don't want to do that but do you ever get to the stage where you say look this horse is dangerous you know i we've really got to look for another horse has that happened Oh yeah, it's happened uh, not often. Uh, I'm all for trying to make those relationships work out, and a lot of times they will. Uh, but yeah, there comes a time, and I, I try to be honest with the owner. I say, you know, it's like this is where you are, this is where your horse is, this is where your horse needs to be, so you can safely ride it. Are you willing to put in the time and the effort that it takes? And and sometimes if the answer is no, well, then you know the horse is better off with another owner. If it's a safety issue, uh, and I have done this a couple of times, I've just said, look, this, you should not get on this horse. I couldn't live with myself if anything happened to you. And uh, the, yeah, it's rare, but it does happen. So yeah, it's sad when that happens. Yes, but it does happen. yes, yeah. Another thing too, you know, Katrina, I'm sort of, you know, talking to you, and I know that horses are important to you, but people are important to you. The use of horses in equine facilitated learning, you know, equine assisted, equine facilitated learning. Have you had anything to do with that? You know, where people have made massive breakthroughs because of the breakthroughs or, or you know, you've been working with a horse and then found that the person themselves has made a massive breakthrough. Oh, absolutely. It happens all the time, and it's a really lovely thing to watch. That, and I always tell my students, horses make us better people in so many ways. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and people will, will yeah. You know, I have one uh, student right now, um, yeah, you know, who has uh, you know who has a very difficult time making time for her horse and herself, and and she's been dealing with that all her life. And I sometimes feel like a, like a therapist when I give lessons because things just come out. And I say, well, you know, that's part of what we're working on too. So it probably needs to. So you know, feel free to talk about it. But uh, you know, it's like horses are so amazing in helping us be exactly. 
uh, where we need to be. And so, you know, if, we're, if we have people, uh, if, you know, if I've, I've worked with people that are too, too loud and too rash and too um, quick with things and, 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 and the horses make them be calmer and, and, and uh, you know, more deliberate and, and slow everything down. And then I have people who, you know, have no confidence and they're, they, they're anxious and they're worried and uh, they're like, like, like this, this um, current student of mine that I'm thinking of who, you know, really has a hard time even thinking that she's very important and she second guesses everything and the horse makes her, you know, just be a lot more, more firm and a lot more clear and take on a, a, a leadership role that, that she can now take on in other aspects of her life and then and, and have clearer boundaries. And so horses are just so amazing because whatever, you know, we need to work on, uh, they will teach us. Yeah, if people are overconfident and, and arrogant, and I've had a couple of those too, well, then the horses will take you down a notch very quickly and say, well, yeah, this, <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't work so well. And if people are underconfident, well, then they will give you confidence. It's, yeah, I, I mean, there's, I, I can't think of any other learning tool or, or you know, any other you know, environment that will do that. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right, because we do have, you know, that – Canine assisted and things like that, but I think the equine assisted is so much, so much better, you know, to help people. If you were going to think of your career with horses, okay, and you know, people surprise me because they bring in something different or they might tell me something I've already talked about. If you're thinking about the proudest moment, you know, within your career, what would you say your proudest moment was? Oh, my proudest moment. <laughs> You think, well, you know, I've done well at some shows. I've won, you know, a couple of national shows way back when. Is that really my proudest moment? Um, you know, my proudest moment was when I worked with a very, very difficult off-the-track quarter horse who had a ton of baggage. And I wasn't really, um, uh, no, actually, my, my, I take that back. My proudest moment was more recent. I worked with a very, very difficult quarter horse again that, uh, you know, I started that who had some baggage too. And, uh, you know, that horse, I really thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm, you know, I was 48 years old when I started her. And I thought, okay, I, I should not be doing these things anymore. I mean, that horse really wasn't to be around. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, but she belonged to a very dear friend of mine who said, well, you know, like this thing, you, know, you, you need to do this and I'm really counting on you. And I said, well, I will take my time and do it. And so for two years, I, I really, really, really worked with that mare every day. And, and finally things got a little better. I mean, she was one of those horses where the answer to everything was no. And I put my leg on the horse and I said, well, would you maybe move over one step? And she said, no, no, and you can't make me. And then, you know, she would kick out and she would fuck. And, and, and I was like, you, you try to suggest something and, and you just know the answer is no. And, oh, it's so frustrating and it's so hard to stay calm and, and just do it again every day patiently and, and have the two steps forward and the, one, the three steps back. And then maybe you have two and a half steps forward. And so it just went on and on like that. And so finally, uh, you know, the things got a little bit better. And then, yeah, I, I, you know, like I said, I mean, just, you know, I spent, you know, two full years just working with that horse and, and doing things with her. And we finally, you know, we took her a few places and, and I used her to present at a, at a conference. Uh, and so, you know, then eventually, you know, the, the owner, who's an, an elderly woman, she took the horse, uh, you know, home and said, I will find her a place now. And I just spoke to her you know, a few weeks ago and I said, well, how is Cammie doing? And uh, she said, oh, you will love this. This horse is now working cows and, and she, you know, gets saddled in the dark at five in the morning and talks to the trailer and, and she's just the most confident and she's the best cow horse around and she's on this ranch and, and, and everybody loves her and, and she knows exactly what her job is. And I said, wow. I mean, I felt so proud of that horse because I really thought so many times, oh my God, what will her place be in life? Can she find a place in life? And now we have this absolutely amazing cow pony who just shows everybody how it's done. So I would have just never, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you go out to do a clinic, you know, you go out and you might see, I don't know, you know, so many riders in a day and you're out there and it's a new group and you've never met any of them before. What do you think is the most common fault that they have? You know, common fault, common challenge, common problem, whatever. But what do you think is the most common? And it's a double barrel question. How can it be fixed? Ah, okay. Um, I think the most common issue that I see is people aren't really in tune with their horse enough. They're not really reading the horse right. They're not really listening to the horse enough. So they don't really know their horse well enough. They, they they think they do and they have a program and they have read things and heard things and they're trying really hard, but they don't 
pause enough and think and really check in with their horse. Like, how is my horse doing? What is my What does my horse need from me right now? So that is that missing element that I encounter a lot in, in some riders that are otherwise very skilled even. And um, does that make sense to you? Do, do you see that? Definitely does. Definitely does. And I think it's, you know, that whole connection, it's so important. And the ability to read a horse and the whole, you know, people say things like, that horse did that for no reason, just came out of the blue. And and if you know the horse, you go, oh, no, yeah. no, there was something going to happen. Yeah. We had a, a little while, you know, just a month or so ago, there was a, um, you know, one of the girls here and quite a good horse person, but a bit young. You know, just just not quite as experienced as what she wants to be, but really good, open mind. Anyway, she'd broken a horse in and her friend was riding it. And I pulled her aside and I said, don't let your friend ride this horse anymore. It's an accident waiting to happen. And she was a bit shocked, you know, the horse is going, like the friend could ride. She was an experienced rider. Horse was going well. And um, the next day we went out on a trail ride. Okay, so I could see this horse was just a little bit testing things. Uh, we went out on a trail ride and, um, you know, we were having a lot of fun and we were all experienced riders. There's probably eight of us, maybe six or eight of us. We're all out there and then we stopped to a, a, stopped to a nice spot and uh, there was a, a, there had been a bit of rain, but grass, you know, grass flat area. So there was a bit of a lower area and there was water laying in it and it was fun to go cantering through it and splashing through it. Anyway, just just to keep it all safe, we just, you know, everyone was sort of in the middle of this large flat area and, you know, one or two at a time, they were just, people were just cantering around. Anyway, she ended up riding the young horse and the horse went uh, cantering around, got up to, and it had already walked and trotted through the water. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like it was a bit of a shock. Already walked and trotted through the water, came along in canter, and the horse just propped and bucked. Just got into it because, you know, it was quite, it ended up being a little bit funny because people had got photos of video of it, I think. Um, oh, Steph, you know, you got a video of your horse bucking you off. And, and the girl was quite surprised that the horse said, oh, but she's never done anything like that. And I said, no, I saw that yesterday. You know, that the horse was ready yeah. to do something, it was ready to, to explode. It, yeah, it was just, you know, it's being very polite, but just that little bit of a, you know, swishing tail, ears back, just a little oh, bit yeah, in the yeah. head coming up. Nothing much, just a bit of resistance to go forward. So, yeah, I think people have got to read that. You've got to say, you know, even just the other day I said to someone, this is an accident waiting to happen, but she'd already said yeah, I can see that. I need to do a bit more flat work with this horse before I do any more, you know, sort of go any further. And I think you've got to get that. You know, you've got to get that, an accident waiting to happen. You can see that it's about to happen. Let's stop. Let's get the basics right. Let's make sure the horse is not fresh and not and, – and we're in a very good area here because we can turn our horses out. Our horses live out, you know, so they've got plenty of freedom to go for a walk and a trot and a canter around and a gallop and everything else. But they still get fresh. Yeah, well, of course they do, and 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 yeah, and there's physical issues, and and there's mental baggage that they have, and yeah, and you have to you know realize all of that and think how can I help this horse? And and uh, yeah, and another mistake that people make a lot is like they they come to the barn and they have this agenda like today we're going to work on this, but then you know the horse you know might not need that right now, and then so then you might have to take a step back and say okay, well if the horse doesn't uh, yeah well what does this horse need from me today, and how can I get off a better horse than the horse I got on? So it's. Uh, yeah, and and as to how to how do you get people to to get better at this? It's really difficult. It's really really difficult. A lot of times, you know, I say, well, but yeah, when I say, didn't you feel that, or or yeah, don't you feel that? It's, it's really no. What do you mean? And and so you know, I I I try to to explain a lot, but it's 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 sometimes very difficult to put that into words. And I, what I do a lot too, what does work better is you know when I I watch somebody and and I. I I stop them and I say, why did you just do that? And then they they have to put it into words. And then they realize, okay, well, I was just kind of going through the motions and I didn't really pay attention to what the horse was, was telling me. And they might not have the right thing to do at that time. Or they say, oh, I had to, you know, uh, you know discipline my horse because, you know, he was trying to, to, to buck me off or he was trying to do this to me. And then I was like, oh, let's, let's reframe that a little bit. 
it's it's just it's just a hard thing to get people to feel. But the older I get, the more I try to focus on that. Look, there were two there were two things that you said then. You said, and I think this is really important. What does this horse need from me today? And also, how can this horse be a better horse when I get off than when I get on? Yeah, yeah, that's always the, the guiding principle. Yeah, that's very important. So, yeah, you you have the training scale to guide you, and and that's thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I always go back to that, and I think that's super useful. And so, I think the training scale works in a you know in a micro setting. It works for every ride in the. You go, you, yeah, you start from the, the, the lowest level, and if your horse isn't relaxed, well, then, you know, maybe uh, that's what you need to do that day. And so, and but then it also, it's like this overarching, you know, through the horse's career, it, it gives you, you know, this, this guidance of where it is you're trying to, to go. But then what people, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, don't realize is like, okay, so, you know, so yesterday we were working like on, on, on something pretty advanced, but today we might have to go back and work on something pretty basic. So it's not like this this linear progress where you just keep going up. It's like, you know, a lot of times, well, you know, it's like you have to go take a couple of steps back if you want to go up the net to the next step. Yes. You know, I love having you on the chat. I think that your whole overlook of horses and horse training and everything very much along the lines of, you know, horse welfare, but also thinking about the best in people too, because you, you're not just training horses. You know, it sounds like you're doing a fair bit of people training. Oh yeah, and that was such a hard transition. Like when when I worked for, <laughs> there's another thing I learned from this bad Western trainer, the the Western pleasure trainer I worked for a long long time ago. That was one of the her things too. She kept her clients in this state of, uh, you know, semi ignorance. She didn't want them to learn too much because then she was afraid she would be out of a job. And so she told me once, and I remember this very clearly. Like, oh, those who can do, those who can't teach. And I stopped and I thought, really, uh, no. And <laughs> um, I, yeah, yeah. As I started, you know, training on my own, I realized, oh, I have to work with the owners too, because otherwise, uh, you know, this will never amount to much, and I don't want to keep getting the same horse back and fix the same issues, and that would just be very frustrating and not do anybody any good, and not teach anybody how to get along with their horses. So now I consider myself more of a relationship counselor. And so I do spend time with the horse and I try to explain things to the horse. And then I spend time with the, the owner and then I try to you know, put the two together where they understand each other. And it is so difficult. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, I had to really work on you know, not being a native speaker of English. That, that, of course, plays a role too. But just the language around instruction, I think that's one of the things that I write about and think about a lot. You know, when I tell somebody, oh, you know, I used to tell people all the time things that, that just instruct, I, I thought instructors just tell their students, like, you know, put your heel down. Well, then you put your heel down, then you, you push yourself away from the horse, you cram your heel down, you try to do it extra well for your instructor. And so then your whole position just goes to where you look like you just swallowed a broomstick and, and it doesn't do any good in that way. So all from one innocent comment. And, and so I, I'm trying to be super, super careful and, and, and try to just, uh, you know, find, uh, you know, language that, that works better and, and is more constructive. And it's kind of a messy process. You're right. And I think that if you do, if you, you're doing the right thing by the person, and then they're more likely to keep coming back because they can feel the progress, the horse is happier, uh, and they can go and work away and work together. Yeah, no, but now my biggest goal for my students is always, you know, and I tell them that, you know, it's like, I will be so proud of the day when you don't really need me anymore. I mean, that really is the goal, that they can just say, wow, I, I, I feel it now. I, I, I get it now. Yeah. Now, just thinking, and I know that we've had quite a lot of um, plans upset, you know, this year with COVID, but, um, you know, say you've got a vaccination, everything's cool. What have you got planned in the next 12 months or so? Oh, well, I would like to uh, you know, go back to competing a little more than we did this year, which was a, you know, a bunch of virtual shows, which was fun. But uh, you know, um, I'd like to, you know, competing isn't all I do and even the main thing I do. But uh, yeah, I would like to do some um, in the Western dressage mainly. And then I have a very nice young and illusion that uh, you know, maybe we'll get to do some classical shows. And um I also, I work with the Best Horse Practices Summit, so, uh, you know, that also, of course, got canceled this year, and so I will be doing another presentation, um, you know, at the next Best Horse Practices Summit, which will probably be in October in Kentucky, so I look forward to that, um, and, um, yeah, in, in terms of horses, no, I just look to, uh, you yeah, know, ride every horse that comes through my barn to the best of my ability and take them as far as they can go. 
It's a wonderful aim to have that, you know, to ride every horse to the best of their ability and, and um, take them as far as they can go. I think that's an ideal goal to have for, for anyone. If- yeah, and it's hard because then if you have a, you know, I struggle with that because, well, I've never really struggled with that part of it. I always had horses that, you know, nobody ever thought could go very far. And then they went further than people thought. So I've, I've had that several times. Now I have a horse that actually is very nice and talented and, and, uh, you know, she's not actually mine, but I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, collaborating with her with, uh, you know, with the client. So we're, we're, you know, uh, you know, kind of you know, doing this joint deal, but this is just a lovely, lovely horse, and 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 I've started her, and she does. She has no baggage, and she has talent, and so I find m- myself in this unfamiliar situation that I have to, you know, be careful to to not ask for too much, and to not ask for more than what her you know, state of development and her ability is right now. So it's uh, it's that's a new learning experience to have a horse with, with with the talent, where I then have to say, okay, is this really fair to ask right now? Yep. Katrin, hopefully on your agenda too is to come back and uh, chat to us again. I've talked to you a lot. We've talked more about philosophy than the actual techniques, but I'd like to, um, if you can come back and we can talk a little bit more about a few different techniques, I think that would be really good. I'm certainly looking forward to chatting and catching up with you again soon. Yeah. Oh, this is yeah, this has been a real pleasure. And yeah, anytime, just give me a call and I'll be happy to come back on Horse Chats anytime you want me to. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks very much for your time today. And I will um, talk to you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 